So a lot of people who work in Ten Park Plaza would tell you that their job is to build and rebuild highways and not do community development, right? You can, there's a different secretariat for that. Exactly. Now, that assumes that we all are operating in silos and we live in an interconnected world. I think the idea that we should all be operating in silos is a sort of an anachronism in today's world. So I agree with you. I think that these are connected. Now there are limitations, legal limitations on how some of that, how that money Metropolitan Highway System, which is the toll-funded system that starts at Route 128 and comes into Boston and connects the tunnels and the, what we call the Big Dig, there are limitations on what you can do with that revenue. My name is Harry Madison and I'm a board member of the Charles River Conservancy and uh, an Austin resident and it's great to see uh, so many of you here today and just to introduce the evening I wanted to talk for a few minutes about how sort of three different ways to think about the Mass Pike and the Austin Interchange. It's a regional connector, it's a local barrier, and it's a future opportunity. Uh, so Anthony Fox was the uh, Secretary of Transportation under President Obama and he grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina which was a city that <coughs> like Boston and many other cities, got torn apart uh, by highway uh, construction. He said federal money and state decision making led to two highways surrounding the neighborhood, destroying the connective tissue. Neighbors were separated from neighbors. The corner store was gone because the corner was gone. I grew up living with those barriers, even though I had no idea how they came to be or what they really meant. And I think that uh, pretty well describes what a lot of us are living in describes the neighborhood where I'm raising my kids and the opportunity we have to change that right now is really pretty tremendous. So the Mass Pike and the interchange are certainly a barrier for the people who live next door to it. It's a barrier for the institutions, uh, primarily Harvard and Boston University that have campuses next to the interchange. <coughs> And it's a barrier for the environment. Back in 2014, the Boston Society of Architects hosted a pair of charrettes to start thinking about how to take down these barriers as the interchange project uh, moved through its design phase. Uh, two different design teams that were uh, led by Alan and Keyshore, who were uh, glad to have joining us tonight, came up with two different ideas, but you can see what they share in common is creating uh, significant new parkland along the river and then drastically improving the connections between that parkland and the neighborhoods around it. Okay. Two years after that, in 2016, the uh, Boston Planning and Development uh, Agency, and I think it's Tad here? Yep. With Tad, led by Tad Reed and his team, uh, followed up on those ideas and proposed moving Soldiers Field Road away from the uh, river uh, and the, creating some new parkland and then creating an at-grade connection from the new district uh, over Soldiers Field Road which would be put into an underpass and di then directly into that new parkland. And I think one of the best developments we've had in the project uh, in the many years we've been working on it then was Harvard uh, with Joe Bagan and uh, the rest of the team there were able to figure out how to move Soldiers Field Road away, uh, to shift it away from the river as had been uh, <coughs> proposed both by the BSA and the uh, BPDA. And what we have now in the state's plan is the new parkland shown on the bottom there uh, that will create wider paths and uh, some much needed open space. Tonight what we want to talk about is how really we can create a network of uh, new connections for people walking and biking that creating new parkland up here is great. By itself though it's not enough. This needs to be connected for, uh, certainly for residents in Alston, 
for folks living in Brookline, for our neighbors in Cambridge and Watertown, and really think about the regional connections from all those neighborhoods and then into downtown Boston and the Back Bay Esplanade. And all of these are possible as part of the reconstruction of the highway. And it's great to see so many folks here tonight interested in all of that. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Alan Montjoy uh, from the firm NBBJ, who's going to talk uh, more about how this can happen. So I, di I did want to acknowledge that um, uh, the way I got involved in this, other than the early BSA charrette, uh, was uh, having a better city ask MBBJ to help us visualize uh, some of the options, particularly the option that they had been advocating for, which was an at-grade option. And you're going to hear a little bit about that today. Uh, I think that um, Tom Nally and Glenn, who are here tonight, uh, worked very diligently on trying to work out the particular particularities of trying to get an at-grade solution to work within the confines of the area that was available. And really, they were down to inches uh, in trying to figure this out. Uh, where they wanted us to get involved was to help visualize what this would look like both today and in the future, because I th really think that the at-grade solution, uh, while has many opportunities for the future, uh, which the above the reconstruction of the above grade does not offer. Um, so uh, here again, I think it's already been fully described. Uh, this was the DEIR uh, cross section that shows uh, the elevated uh, option of uh, rebuilding the elevated highway. And uh, they did a, a very nice job of showing trees and plants along the edge, which makes one think that this could be a somewhat nicer, narrow path along the edge of Soldier's Field Road. So that's nice in section. And then, of course, they, um, they did a very good job of making this look uh, not so nice. Uh, and of course, it is not so nice uh, right now. And I think that our mindset is such that we have to think beyond today and think a little bit about how this can be changed in the future uh, without the constraints that are, in fact, constraining DOT, which is to get everything in there without having to re-permit anything in the, in the river. So this is exactly what Tom and Glenn said. This, this makes us look, this makes it look bad, uh, but we need to show a future that it won't look so bad. Uh, I don't think you need to see any more than, more than to see this image of Aganis Way and say, with that bridge in, way, in the place, if we rebuild that bridge, it will be there for the next 70 years and we will never be able to get to, that, get to the river from this location and many other locations along the way, no matter what we do on the other areas. Um, I happen to live uh, in that neighborhood, which is the reason I started going to the task force meetings. So for me to get to the Charles River is almost impossible uh, without going a mile out, out of my way to get to the Charles. I could make a, I would love it if I could have a direct path to the river, uh, but I can't because the, the nearest access point is the BU Beach. The, by the way, the BU Bridge does not connect to the Charles. Uh, there are stairs that go down to the highway, but they don't connect to the Charles. And then uh, Cambridge Street. So really very few opportunities to get to the river. I think Harry showed something like this. We would like to envision a future, and we can argue about whether cars go here or not. But let's, let's focus on getting pedestrians into a fully connected network of access points that provide, and I'll just throw out the number, let's make sure we don't have more than a quarter mile of the riverfront unaccessible. Let's make sure that there are quarter mile connections, because I think that will lead to a much better environment. So this, is, this was the rendering that uh, Glenn and Tom asked us to asked, uh, MBBJ to produce, which said, all right, we're going to accept the fact that we have an at-grade condition, which is not so pretty in the short term, but what it will allow us to do is create a bridge at Aganis Way at that midpoint where there is currently no access. And by the way, if West Station doesn't get built anytime soon, there probably won't be a whole lot of pedestrian accessibility between Cambridge and Boston for the near future. So can we get this thing done sooner as part of the highway project and immediately connect down to the river? And, and Glenn was very insistent that we make sure we don't, don't touch the river. 
we have to make sure that this works within the current confines of, of, the, of the permits. But there's also an opportunity at the BU Bridge right now to connect down there where it currently does not connect. So two ends here could actually shorten the distance considerably for me, I'm speaking selfishly, for me to get to the river, uh, which would be great. Uh, and then I think what we have to think about is separating the permitting of the highway and by, all, by no means do we want this to open the door to allow the highway to begin to encroach upon the river. In fact, we want them to stay within their narrow confine of where they have to stay. But later on, let's make sure that we figure out a way to permit a expansion into the river that is entirely for the purposes of the environment, for pedestrians, for activity along the river, to actually extend the esplanade all the way to all the good things that Harry just talked about in front of the sort of the additional park to the south and every, or to the, this is actually north or east or west and that's east. <laughs> it's all upside <laughs> and discombobulated. Um, so this would be the future. And then I, my last slide is showing what, um, what I think all urban designers would like to think about is what could happen eventually. So we're just showing sort of the minimal uh, bridges here and the bridge there. We, we looked to BU's uh, long-term master plan. They actually have plans to build additional uh, student village residence uh, where there's currently parking lots. And there was even some plans for something they call Commonwealth Landing, uh, which suggested an additional capping of the highway at, uh, at where I ride my bike through every day, which is probably one of the worst intersections in all of Boston to get through as a pedestrian. So I would urge you to use your imagination to think what else could happen along this way if we have an at-grade solution and how BU could eventually think about expanding their purview over the turnpike and making better connections to the river in the future. Uh, but I think this vision is what I will end with. I'm Mark Dawson. I'm a landscape architect with Sasaki Associates. Um, our office is in Watertown. We work all over the world, have international practice, so um, we're, we're, we have a pretty deep bench. Um, but in, in the end, my passions are rivers and waterfronts and, and um, public open space, and, and that's where I exist, and, and that's where I um, uh, love to, to work and play. Um, let me just flip through. Again, it's important that the Charles Ribbons Conservancy, Walk Boston, and the Solomon Foundation approached us to, to help them in a little charrette, a collaborative charrette that was incredibly quick. We had a week to, to work through it, um, but we jumped right in because we know and, you know, we believe in place as a, as a, as an ecosystem, as a contributing um, uh, force in cities, and great cities have great public spaces, uh, as does Boston, but we can do better. You know, Marty Walsh is uh, certainly starting to pick up some of the, the, the rhetoric and the important kind of language that, that leads cities to the future. Um, our work on the Chicago Riverfront in Chicago, um, you know, that's a narrow little spit of, of real estate that it was transformed with with the support of the federal government, the city, county, um, and and now it's a place where you know when you take the architectural boat tour, they talk about the riverfront and they're really proud of it. So transformation can happen. Um, if you've been to to Portland, Oregon, of course, this work that Carol Meyer Reed did. Um, has, has also transformed and provided access uh, and intervention on the Willamette in Portland. Or you look at Tom Bosley's work in New York City, um, you know, these places were dilapidated piers if they existed. Um, they've been restored, they've been refurbished, and, and now it becomes, you know, public open space. It's free of charge. Awesome on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, you know, they can do it. They reached out into the river, you know. I'm not saying this is a beautiful solution necessarily, but they were so committed to, to leveraging the river, and, and I think we should be as well in, in the Boston area. 
we talked a little bit, Harry talked a little bit about it, but I think, you know, with West Station and what's happening with the Austin development, there's going to be a neighborhood right next to this. There's neighborhoods just on the other side of the freeway, which is a shame that we've disconnected those. So I would love to see the day when I could see Harry 10 years from now and he's able to walk across <laughs> to the river without disruption and without going out of your way 10 or 15 minutes. And here's what today is. We all know it. It's the place we want to move the fastest through because it's the most uncomfortable in its relationship to the automobile. And the automobile is brutal on this section of the road. It's accelerating. It's fast. It's intimidating. It's just purely frightening. We talked about the on-grade solution. We, we tend to agree with that, that recommendation. But you, you just can't do this without talking about the river. There's, they're connected. They're important neighbors. So without, without having that connection, it's, it's, it, it's sort of like you've drawn a line and there's a fence. And I don't care what my neighbor uh, is doing. And that's not appropriate. And what it may look like, you know, I don't know. Is that an improvement? It's hard to imagine. Um, but I get, I get the idea. I mean, I understand that dim dimensionally this is challenged, but I think that's where we have to think out of, the, out of those boxes. So what we were asked to do is just come up with some visions. These aren't grounded in, in a tremendous amount of technical uh, rigor, um, but based on our conversations with our team and, and with the client group, we were able to sort of establish some, some important parameters. One of it is making just a healthier community by allowing better cycling, better walking, better jogging, and, and in general, exercise. And then some of our kind of goals around this were really about connectivity. We've heard about that. Um, connective tissues. I love to hear politicians talking like that. That means they're starting to listen, I hope. But placemaking, et cetera. Uh, and then we really started to look at the, the components of how do you connect to the river, regardless of b existing barriers today. But the opportunity at the BU Bridge is critical to make that connection, as, it w as well as it is on uh, Leganus Way and also into the, into the neighborhood of Alston Yards. But we looked, sort of compared these prototypes that we studied. And now they'll be um, displayed in a larger, slightly larger format for you. But one idea would be you fill in the river, right? You fill about 40 feet into the river to provide that needed dimension of moving the pedestrians off of the curb and, and down and into a more riverine environment. Now, this is complicated to permit. However, you have the benefits of improving ecology and biodiversity. There's, there's, there's trade-offs, and there's some real positive trade-offs here. Um, needless to say, what in the experience of moving through the basin might begin to look like. It's as if you're further down near the, the sailing. And, and there's dimension. You need dimension here. The other one would be where, more like the Schuylkill River, where you're really out over the water on piers. Um, feasible, permittable, challenging, uh, yes, but, but certainly an opportunity to really allow the pedestrian to be prioritized versus the automobile. And really, this, this is really just a, a vision for what that might begin to look like and, and how the community could use it. And I think really the, the idea here behind these two concepts are about <coughs> vision for the river. We need to have vision for the river. And uh, it's not enough to just tolerate a very narrow passage in this particular area. And that's it. Thank you. My name is Joe Began. I work with Harvard University in the Alston Initiative Group. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, as Harry said, uh, a, um, a path that we've identified for our work in looking at the rail yard and West Station location and how you can leverage some additional open space along the southern boundary of the project area. Um, but first, I'm going to start with kind of the general context of what we see to the west of uh, the area that's uh, been talked about, the throat, sort of what the throat is feeding into to the west and what's feeding uh, back into the, uh, into the throat. And then talk about uh, a little bit of background on this flip idea we have because it's important to understand that as far as how we're creating, uh, we see you could create some open space that would be uh, uh, provide connections and, uh, and actually tie into some of the um, 
uh, crossings that have been discussed uh, earlier. So um, I'd like to start with this slide. Is it kind of, kind of shows the evolution of what has happened in the Alston neighborhood over the past um, the past 10 years and what some of the improvements are going forward. If you uh, were out in the neighborhood 10 years ago, no bike paths, uh, limited access points to the river. I think the story that you heard playing out in the throat area really plays out around the bend in the river as, as well. Um, over time, um, you know, cycle tracks have emerged, um, uh, bike lanes have been added, and uh, parkland improvements have occurred um, within the neighborhood. Others are, are planned, uh, more gateways are being looked at, Telford and Everett Street is, is one uh, um, piece. There's improvements uh, providing some gateways and parklands that would come through the um, uh, through our enterprise research campus area, which is this this area here between um, Cambridge Street and Western Avenue, and then finally, you know, some north-south connections that start to tie all of that back into the interchange area itself. Um, this this um, graphic um, shows some of those uh, connections, and the kind of the glowing green really are. Uh, connections that might be a little bit more park-like. Um, these, the other connections are where you might see um, on-street or, or um, cycle track connections. But really, these the path connections that you you see coming, you know, the planned on Cambridge Street South over it, over at this location. Oops, let me point because it might work better. So over at this location, at Cambridge Street South, um, tying into the new gateway that was that was discussed there, but. Then also you start to see these other fingers reaching into the neighborhood, uh, open space being created and kind of in integrated into a network. So as you get down to the to the throat and the improvements that you know could happen down here, kind of feeding into this, this fan of in improvements. Um, the piece that I'll focus in on is shown here. So it's essentially an at grade connection that runs from about Harvard Ave. Uh, it would go down to uh, Babcock or Anus. It could extend down and then tie into. Louder, think, please. Uh, could tie into the connection that um, uh, you know that Alan had mentioned. You know, as far as coming over at uh, a Gainus Way, um, it also creates some opportunity for a better Franklin Street Bridge connection at that location. Uh, just to to kind of <coughs> orient people, uh, this is the current. Mass dot phase one uh, option. So essentially, the highway is built. It has uh, an interim rail yard, uh, no west station, and the two tracks running um, uh, as they do today for the Worcester Framingham branch along the southern side of the property line here, and then a connection from Malvern Street, a uh, pedestrian bike connection from Malvern Street. So Commonwealth Avenue would be down here. Alston neighborhood up here froze over in that direction. Um, what what we looked at um, in thinking about where West Station and the rail yard should be is uh, should we rethink the idea that the what the station should be on the southern side of the of the current storage tracks? So today the current plan, the long range plan, which DOT would call the uh, the 2040 plan or later. West Station sits down here with the tracks to the north. What we're looking at is whether there was a more efficient use of space by, that you could uh, get by flipping it, putting the station on the north side, and then putting um, the tracks on the south side. What we found was if you did that, you're, you're able to essentially pull those rail elements 35 to 40 feet away from the property line. By doing that, you create an at-grade connection uh, along that edge. That's a buffer park. It's almost three quarters of a mile long. Could tie into a, you know, an, a Gainus Way connection. Tie into uh, Harvard Ave at grade. So it, it starts to form a better condition along that edge uh, with the neighborhood. Um, and this just shows some of the cross sections. That, you know, if you can. If you're looking at the two cross sections here at the neighborhood and here, 
at BU, that's what's shown here. So you can see the plan for a, a noise wall at that location is right back up against the property. So however deep those, those yards are, sometimes only 20 feet, you then have a 20 foot wall sitting off of that. Um, what we would look at is pulling that, you know, the 30 to 35 to 40 feet away from uh, those, those properties. And then when the, this flip is done, air rights would be built, the rail yard would be decked over. So it kind of fits in with this idea of how do you tie the two sides, the neighborhoods on the two sides of the track together? How do you hide the rail elements and provide that connection? And I think that might be it. Oh, one other thing. That's showing a long term. So the station in its final location. This, this is showing the possibility that you could do that as part of the early implementation. So you could, if, if the idea holds that the, you're doing the rail flip and the station's going to the north in the future, you could do an interim station on the southern side. You could pull all the rail to the north, and it allows you to get that, the benefit of that open space connection in there from day one, uh, which we think would be a, a useful outcome at the, at, the, uh, at the end of the project. And in one of the other things that it also allows you to do is a more simple at grade connection from Malvern Street down to this at grade. And, and you know, if the Malvern Street bridge is built, the north south connection for bus transit connection that's been discussed, um, that would be one way to do it. If it's a pedestrian bike connection, you could imagine that it could be pulled into that alignment instead of ramping up next to the homes here, it could ramp up here and cross over, kind of giving, you know, moving the infrastructure away from uh, those areas. And this is just what we see is um, some of this, uh, the benefits, you know, creation of the open space, uh, simplification, also of the Fr uh, Franklin Street pedestrian bridge, which right now has a lot of switchbacks in it. We think right of way can be made, uh, made available to provide a more simple uh, bridge connection at that point. Um, kind of create some space between the noise wall and the residents. Um, and then the final piece for fans of utilities is that it would give you better access to a utility line that runs under there. So, so yeah, so uh, I'm here to talk about sort of two guiding principles for how we might connect um, east of this project and you know certainly we would we would relish the opportunity at the Esplanade to be a direct abutter right now we're sort of just kind of in the neighborhood and and to Alan's comments from earlier I'm delighted to, to talk to you all tonight also as an abutter myself I live in the Audubon Circle neighborhood sort of just inside of this project and so the pain is local for a lot of us the pain uh, that gets experienced on this project gets felt by sort of those that are representing thousands here tonight and I th and really honestly feel like those that will represent generations to come and so for our you know our guiding principles principles in thinking about this project. It's promoting the establishment or improvement of connections to and from the Esplanade and, and throughout the riverfront. And so getting to the riverfront and then moving along the riverfront. And that includes making improvements, that's off that screen there, but making improvements to the public realm that accommodate increased usage through the improved access, which we all know will come with improved access. And so I think many of you know what the, what the sort of traditional definition or understanding of where the Esplanade is, the Back Bay Esplanade has been referred to tonight. We're the 3.1 mile span, um, principally between the Museum of Science and the BU Bridge. Um, as was discussed a little bit earlier, you can't easily get then from the BU Bridge um, to the other side, to the western edges of what could be this new Esplanade. Um, so there's 3.1 miles there. We're mostly accessed through nine foot bridges over Storo Drive, so we share some of the same pain points um, that are experienced in this area. Um, our two at grade connections are though from the east and from the west. So coming from the Museum of Science or coming from the BU Bridge, um, albeit uh, in the condition that it's in today. Um, and improving the connection to the west from the Esplanade and, and back to the east from this area, um, you know, allows the three million visitors that spend time on the Esplanade each year the opportunity to move um, farther up the river to enjoy all the benefits of the Alston neighborhood, this newly developing area, um, and everything that exists in that area today that makes it great. 
Um, you know, and I'll talk just a little bit today about some of the ongoing maintenance improvement that's been happening on the Esplanade that will help plan um, for this project and, and hopefully improve the connectivity of this project. So um, these first, you know, three slides, I just will say, are, are the pain points as we sort of experience them today. Um, and I, along with Mark, I've, I'm having my uh, own PowerPoint issues, but uh, Dr. Paul w Dudley White Path. So uh, this is a pretty well-known area today. This is one of our real pain points, the fact that um, there is no seamless connection underneath the BU Bridge going east-west. Um, there's the, the sort of very narrow wooden boardwalk that many of us know and, and probably don't love um, that kicks out around the BU Bridge. I myself, this, this past October, found myself in this area, um, given that I live just a couple minutes on the other side of the BU Bridge um, in Audubon Circle, trying to figure out how do I get from the head of the Charles back over to where I live in the most um, efficient manner possible, which of course at that time was crossing Storo Drive. Uh, you can see that sort of cutout right there that is probably not what anyone should be doing. Um, but when faced with a number of bad choices, sometimes those are the ones that people make. And so, um, as was discussed earlier, there there is no staircase up to the BU Bridge to then cross over uh, the B, using the BU Bridge um, to cross over the highway um, back over to uh, to the neighborhoods. And so, um, a real pain point that's in that area. Um, a second is that the Esplanade and the riverfront get cut off um, from the city, from BU and Alston, um, by a, a number of sort of these problems that have been highlighted today. And I think everybody knows that it's difficult to access that area. And this is a picture, I believe, taken from, from the hotel um, that sits sort of right along Sto Soldiers Field Road. And you can see, you know, I, I, I like this picture particularly because you can see both the um, the train, you know, area, um, the train tracks over to the right showing that opportunity, but also the incredibly narrow strip of parkland that exists there today between the highway um, and the river, which really presents a, a dynamic opportunity. Um, and then finally, the third opportunity is to, um, and pain point as it exists today, um, the substandard public realm that I just discussed and showing that really small sliver that exists between uh, the roadways and, and the water. Um, so there has been some work done to date that I think can segue nicely into this project. Um, about four years ago, MassDOT and, and DCR commissioned a Charles River Basin pedestrian uh, and bicycle connectivity study that we're um, at the Esplanade beginning to, um, to at least try to implement, um, at the Esplanade Association, I should say, trying to implement uh, east of this project. But you can see a lot of thinking that's been done on how to improve a number of the connection points from the neighborhoods to the public realm along the riverfront. But you know, as you can see in this graph, most of the area that's being talked about today between River Street and the BU Bridge um, was not much the subject of, of imagination or dreaming or what could be or any, any form of improved connection that could come through unchoking the throat and giving more thought to um, how to bring these neighborhoods back into connection with one another. And so and even as sort of as thoughtful a study as this one was, there's still some room for growth in, in moving, um, moving minds around the concept of improved connection in this area. Um, and so, you know, some work's been done, at least again, east of this project on the Esplanade in recent years by DCR, um, you know, with the, with the support of a number of advocacy groups to repave the pathways, to make them more accessible and open to people, to try to correspond to the way in which people are using the area. And of course, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind ahead of any improvements to the, the throat area is, is taking into account the fact that we have good data associated with the, the usership um, of the other public realm opportunities in this area that would look most like what the throat could look like uh, with, with an improved infrastructure in that area. And so, um, you know, this just one quick example of that. Um, you know, with our work at the Esplanade Association, something that we're doing this year is commissioning a study on the, the possible separated use of our own pathways, which I think could serve as a model for the throat area. The fact that, um, again, with improved access and, and increase in both population, and I think certainly the bicycle population, we're finding that there are, are a number more users of our pathways than there used to be, and that those are not always at, um, at I guess, like-minded uh, odds, or like-minded um, ways in which of wanting to use that that area and so um, sometimes one use can frustrate another a high-speed commuter biker for example and we're seeing sort of the takeoff of uh, delivery bikers uh, looking to access the Esplanade um, and sometimes that is in sort of the same narrow area um, where you have runners walkers um, strollers um, and so we're trying to you know certainly get out ahead of and I think can can certainly dovetail with the efforts of this this project um, how do you imagine a system that allows for all uses but does so in the most safe and efficient manner 
manner possible. And so, you know, we're, we're doing some thinking that'll begin uh, this year on that with, I think we have the expectation of possibly a pilot project by the end of the year that could reduce some of the amount of pavement on the Back Bay Esplanade um, and create a, an improved condition for runners um, that is both permeable surfaces, better for the environment, and sort of begins to try and be a test case for how down the river we also could think about the Alston Esplanade. Um, and then we're, we've been partnering with a number of groups, principally the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and the Charles Gate Alliance on a reimagined um, park area in another area of the waterfront that's very near um, this site that has been sort of choked off by Storrow Drive by roadways from the river. And so there are some wonderful plans also seated with uh, the support of the Solomon Foundation to think about how we might reclaim um, parkland that can serve as an important connection between the Esplanade and the Emerald Necklace. And so this is yet another area that with an improved uh, set of conditions over at, um, at the throat, you could imagine how it would then provide easy access to um, not just the Esplanade, you know, east of, of the throat, but actually also the Emerald Necklace. And so, you know, in just sort of summary, I mean, this, this, this project provides a really uh, important set of opportunities to better connect Alston and the newly forming neighborhood in Alston to the Esplanade, to the riverfront, uh, provide an improved riverfront experience, which I think you've heard a number of ways in which that's been imagined today. And, and the Esplanade Association, you know, is looking forward to hearing more about um, all the different opportunities to improve, um, you know, the public realm. Uh, relative to the park space, and certainly we, you know, we know there's a number of stakeholders in this this process, and we've been, you know, thankful for our ongoing partnership with the Charles River Conservancy to imagine how, you know, any newly developed park space in this area might be managed in the future, and, and making sure that it is the result of a true public-private partnership that doesn't just rely on on the the strapped resources statewide of, of DCR and the state, um, but that from the very beginning, I think the best parks that we've seen here and around the country are the ones that have have thought at the beginning about not just their development, but also their ongoing operations. And, and we're thrilled to be a partner in that ongoing conversation. Um, and then, you know, considering all, all the various different possible enhancements um, that, that would be, um, that would uncongest the area, if you will. Um, one of them that I know some thinking has been given to is, is the Grand Junction. And that, that serves as sort of the, the main impediment between the east-west connection at the Esplanade, at the traditional understanding of where the Esplanade ends at the BU Bridge. And so, you know, um, you know we're, we're not the planners, and there's some fine ones in the room today. So really, you know, we would look forward to some thought being given to how, how do you specifically um, reconnect um, in that area. So I think with that, I'll turn it back over to Harry. Great. Thank you. So to sort of summarize and wrap up the presentation uh, portion of the evening, uh, Antonio de Mombro, who's a um, urban planner who's been working I think, sort of all over Boston and I'm sure well beyond for uh, on all kinds of fast, fascinating projects, uh, is going to share some thoughts about, uh, about this project. Uh, and then we'll move to uh, the panel discussion portion of the evening. I'm really thankful to all of you that have made the presentation tonight. Because usually the highway presentations and the infrastructure presentation are so dry, are so dry, and uh, there is no feeling of the place. But we need to pay a lot of attention to those dry diagrams. So I, uh, my comments tonight are uh, divided in several pieces. First of all, I want to encourage all of you to continue this marvelous work that you started. I want to offer my first comment that while I am grateful, I am also uh, a little bit disappointed, disappointed, and I wouldn't be Antonio Di Mambro if I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I uh, would uh, define the ideas as uh, thoughtful timidity. And I didn't ask for that. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we should unlock those two words. And uh, I encourage you not to be timid, thoughtful, but think about the whole and think about the future, and not the unfortunate historic moment that we are living in today. Connectivity is the name of the game. And that's where 
the some of the the uh, timidity, in my opinion, still is. I think you have done a marvelous job on uh, the uh, unlocking this news at the corner there. However, you have missed a beautiful opportunity. This diagram shows, for example, this street here, which is called Cambridge City South. You know, all these streets in the engineering diagrams, they're all the same size and they all look the same. And then the other thing that you need to pay attention is the color. Because something that is yellow, something that is purple, something that is something else, it makes a big difference visually when you see it built. And that's what I'm scared of when it's built. The deck over West Station is going to be at plus 24 feet. And then this small strip of paper connects it down to zero. It's three yeah. floors. <coughs> it's three floors. Yeah. Three floors that, uh, thank you, that uh, need to be negotiated. So the first encouragement, the same thoughtfulness that you have shown in your riverfront design, please extend it to the nightmare of the grid. Another very important missed opportunity, this street here is going to be by far the most important street in this new neighborhood is Cambridge Street South. It's not going to be this one here. Well, when you get here, you, we have seen that image is so timid. It should be, the, the meeting of the river should be emphasized, should be welcomed, and connectivity. Why? Why, at least now that you are dreaming, you don't build here a fantastic beautiful 21st century pedestrian bridge which symbolizes the union of the river for the pedestrian and the bike the river that has been taken away because of the car so please pay attention here as well as you have done here very very important and i want to emphasize that because you do a beautiful environment here along uh, the river, but then you have to negotiate the bottleneck at River Street the same way you had to negotiate down here. Give up to River Street, go across, and go to that beautiful park that is on the other side. Another idea, always in the timidity, thoughtfulness. I think that you have here a fantastic opportunity. I know how much work it has taken to put the ramps here uh, of the Storo Drive going down. And you have gotten us that sliver of green. I'm sorry about Harvard. I have to disclose, by the way, I was a uh, I was a consultant to Harvard. I am not under con contract, I, and I do not have any uh, any uh, conflict of interest. And I don't have an office, and I do not look for work. So I am speaking my mind. So my dear friend, Joe Bacon, I, I think it is wonderful, this sliver, but we should be more generous. When you do the negotiation of the buildings that are going to be there, try to give us on the other side another 200 feet, 150 feet in some places, so that the park on this side is as generous as the one in Cambridge. 
and then connect it. So pay attention to the different colors because from here you gotta get down there and then you gotta go up and all of that world has <coughs> not been explored and we need to do it because if we cannot resolve this here and leave everything left behind. Now to the most painful piece and the greatest opportunity. I started thinking about this 50 years ago when I was an undergraduate at MIT. And I always wanted to have, I saw this always for 50 years as one of the greatest opportunity to make the most important investment for this century in terms of transportation hub and connectivity. And I coined the idea of the West Station. And I have done for Harvard some images which remain within the, the draw in Harvard because they are not ready to talk about that. However, I am thankful for the good work that you are putting here to make this happen. But we must make sure that becomes an investment, an important infrastructure that connects all the nexus of uh, new mode of transportation they go from the high-speed rail to the uh, urban ring, a thousand other connections that will allow then the three universities that live around here and the neighborhood to really make here a remarkable new piece of city. I hope that as you proceed to make plans for this, because of the usual thing of, oh, it's a, it's a budgetary, it's, you then end up with a station similar to the one that they built at Fenway Park. Look at that station, the T. This may end up twice as large, but pretty much there. So I encourage you all not to be timid. One last thing is about the neighborhood here. They deserve better. They deserve better. They haven't gotten. You cannot uh, build a wall 20 or 30 feet high and then make an effort and say, well, we'll push it back 30 feet. I can tell you since I've, I've fought some battles here in Boston, there is one of these examples. And is in East Boston, Jeffrey Point. Go see it. That's what you should not design there. This year is a wonderful opportunity if you deck it. I'm not asking for the decision to be made to deck I'm not asking for the decision to be made to deck this, but as the, 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 the powerful people that will decide this matter begin to make decisions, make sure, make sure that this new infrastructure is designed in such a way that it can be decked over, because otherwise, they will build it and nothing will be done. Oh, we cannot put a new structure there. An important thing that relates to all the work that you have done here. I noticed that after a lot of discussion, everybody seems to coalesce around the idea that we should bring the highway down. Now, an interesting, an interesting challenge because the, the railroad that from here has to go to Cambridge has to negotiate at one to three percent, go over 
the highway, and then deep down, it go on the bridge that is under the BU bridge. It's not easy. Look at this three-dimensionally, please. And make sure that you don't take down the highway. You have the beautiful view corridor on Bab Babcock or Aganis, and then you see the train trying to do that, <laughs> which may be OK. But pay attention to all of this. Look at these things three-dimensionally. One last thing, <laughs> and I will, uh, I will shut up. <laughs> uh, I've designed a few stations. So when they present to you a diagram with four tracks, and it's a minimum width, tell the engineers, please show us what it should really be, because Every time I was confronted with that diagram, the, the fatness of the station increases 30%. Okay? So I think there is still a little bit more work. And I'm picking on Joe Bacon because I worked with him. I, 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 I can do that. And thank you and your institution for everything you are doing. So thank you, I'm back, and I will not leave again. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so we're now gonna have a panel discussion uh, moderated by Renee Loth. Uh, Renee is the editor of Architecture Boston Magazine. Uh, before that, she was the editorial page editor for the Boston Globe. She's a neighbor of mine in Brighton, and uh, we're very fortunate to have her and a uh, wonderful panel. When the Turnpike was first extended from 128, Route 128 to South Station in 1962. Um, there was a plan to have it be an at grade um, highway running into the city, but it required uh, moving Star Drive and taking about eight acres of land that was that owned by the then MDC, the Metropolitan District Commission, which uh, controlled the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, Riverways, the river highways, and they, the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority was going to take that land by eminent domain, and you know push Star Drive out of the way and um, extend the turnpike along the road where Star Drive is now into the city. So the MDC sued. It became a you know political um, struggle. The um, turnpike Authority, uh, according to Fred, let's see if I can get this right. The, the Turnpike Authority was run by the. Democrats and the MDC was run by the Republicans, and you know, never the twain shall meet. So um, the SJC got involved. I'm really compressing some very complicated uh, political history, but the Supreme Judicial Court got involved and they ruled that both agencies had equal powers of eminent domain, so they could each keep taking, seizing each other's property forever at infinitum. Um, and so the Turnpike Authority chairman at that time, William Callahan, decided, um, kind of in a fit of peak, um, to just abandon the whole idea and build the 3,000 foot long viaduct um, elevated over, um, to, you know, to bring the highway into um, South Station. So that's a little history about um, how we might have thought about this otherwise. Okay, so. I think I just want to start with Emily for a second because I think the um, we heard the word connectivity a lot tonight. This is an um, underlying theme: how to connect um, people to the river, how to connect from the Esplanade downtown up through the western parts of the river, how to connect North Alston, um, which is you know the new Harvard University whatever it's called enterprise neighborhood, whatever the thing is being called. Um, I also used to live over there. On, uh, on Bagnell Street, um, and, you know, connecting North Austin to this part of Austin, South Austin and Commonwealth Avenue. Um, so talk a little bit about the work you do and how um, outdoor spaces and public spaces um, connect people. Uh, so the November project, for anyone who doesn't know about it, you did a great job um, explaining mm. it, really is about building a worldwide community through fitness. And so uh, we do offer um, completely free weekly workouts 
um, that people can simply just show up to. And recognizing that a lot of times the hardest part about um, staying fit and continuing to, to be active in our lives in the harshness of winter and um, in that sort of thing um, with lots of excuses available um, is just showing up. And so once you're there, um, you, we have a strong community of really inspiring and excited, um, motivated people to help that movement happen and continue to build the health um, of our community in our, our physical health. Um, and if we are able to connect communities and make it geographically um, possible uh, for people to make it to workouts, and one of the, the biggest things that happens is people say, oh, the, the workout on Monday is X number of miles away, or I can't get public transportation to there, or it's just too hard to get there, um, then we lose that opportunity for people uh, to show up and to be connected in that way. Um, and so what we find with a community like the November Project is that people from all around different communities and, and areas of Boston and greater Boston are able to um, meet each other, get to know each other, um, and build what really becomes a much stronger community um, as, a, as a foundation and not just, um, not just working out, but a, a bigger, stronger community. So yeah, so I, th I, I just think it's interesting to think about the social connections as well as the physical connections. You know, Boston is a city that's balkanized, and um, this, you know, very complicated transportation project also offers, I think, opportunities to integrate the city better socially as well as physically. Um, so not to be a buzzkill, because we saw so many beautiful um, presentations here tonight, but I'm going to turn to, to Jim now, and... Um, <laughs> I'm often known as a buzzkill. Yeah. <laughs> and ask um, him, and then really the whole panel, uh, you know, why aren't we doing this then? I mean, what are the impediments that are keeping us from moving this forward? I mean, I understand it's a complicated engineering problem and a transportation problem and so on, but um, I think everybody here kind of agrees with the, the basics. We're looking for a 21st century uh, solution here, not something that's going to be repeating the problems or the mistakes of 1962 or earlier. Um, why can't we get there? Well, we might get there. I mean, you know, I think part of the part of the issue is that you still have people, unfortunately, who are planning projects like this, who are stuck in 20th century, auto-centric thinking. Now, you gave a good history lesson about how the, the first chairman of the Turnpike Authority wanted to fill the river to build a highway, and he couldn't do it, so we have the elevated. And you're looking at the last chairman of the Turnpike Authority, um, a distinction without, that comes without honor. <laughs> um, but as the last chairman of the Turnpike Authority, um, I can say um, that was a mistake, but it was not viewed as a mistake then, right? It was viewed as what you did in an autocentric environment to move people through a city that nobody at that time believed anyone really wanted to live in. So now fast forward to today. And so I think part of the issue, part of how we solve this, is framing the argument. So framing the argument begins by saying, the last thing we should be doing is doubling down on a mistake. Right? And doubling down on a mistake means several things in connection with this site. It means keeping the highway elevated. It also means keeping the, the throat choked. Why is the throat important? It's important because if you look at this map, you'll see that what we're really talking about is or ought to be a sustainable mobility ecosystem, right? That's what this is. And if you look at today's drivers of jobs, today's drivers of the economy, a better city, we talked about a better city, Tom Nally, and I worked on a report that was issued in February talked about the importance of transit to the metropolitan Boston economy. Talked about where jobs are, are happening, where housing is happening, where the growth is happening, what's fueling our economy. I often like to joke and say nobody lives here because of the weather. Right? So this, this spring kind of proves my point. <laughs> they live here because they're looking for a particular quality of life. And so, and one of the aspects of that is our or ought to be our multimodal mobility system. 
If you look at where, where the jobs are, where the gross domestic product is, in Massachusetts, 84, 82% of the gross domestic product in the state is generated in Metro Boston, and most of that disproportionately happens in transit clusters. That's what this is or will be when West Station is built. The, the idea that you would deny people the ability to pleasantly connect from the downtown of Boston to this site by not un un unlocking this choke point is an idea that runs against the kind of sustainable mobility that we know helps grow the economy and jobs. So part of, part of the issue is we have to candidly say to the folks at MassDOT, we won't accept mid-20th century thinking. This was, that was not a mistake then, but in retrospect it was. It's no different than the big dig. And we won't accept doubling down on that. But we need to be armed with the data that shows jobs growth, housing growth, quality of life, all of the factors that make this place the livable, enjoyable place that we want it to be, that we aspire for it to be, are connected to getting all these pieces right. And so I think that's the way to do it. The other way to do it, I would say quickly, you've got to leverage the important stakeholders. I mean, I don't know how many people in the room can pick up the phone and take it, get a meeting taken with the highest officials in state government or the city. But Harvard can. <coughs> BU can. And so, and you know, they're going to be asked, they're being asked to put real money into West Station. If I were them, I'd say, you want my money? Well, how about improving this? Right? What's, where's the quid pro quo going to be? And so the practical political reality is to hopefully have the powerful stakeholders who can't pick up the phone and get the meeting in a position where they're supporting doing something along the river that in and of itself shouldn't be looked at as a, in a vacuum, but is a connected part to what ought to be and should be the most sparkling sustainable mobility development site of this part of the 21st century. That's good. good. Tom, do you want to offer some thoughts about why we're not here or how to get there? Well, I think sort of picking up on, on Jim's theme a little bit, one of the other themes Connectivity has certainly been a theme that we've talked about. Another theme has been investment and, and a realization that this is an investment for several generations going forward. You know, we won't have an opportunity to come back and, and do this correctly uh, again for a long, long time. So we really need to find the right solution um, on, on how to move forward with this. Um, I appreciate Mark's studies. I think he did an amazing job in a very short period of time to come up with the schemes that he did specifically for this um, choke the throat issue here. Um, but I think we need to really stop and think about those and, and figure out which one is the right investment and which one is the long-term solution. Um, to me, that, that question is, is pretty simple as a landscape architect. Um, something on ground is a whole lot easier to maintain and invest in than something that's up in the air over the water. And I realize that has a more complicated permitting path and, and, and technical issues and so on and so forth. But if we come back 50 years ago, 50 years from now, and look at this as Jim is doing, um, will we have made the right decision? And will that decision be good uh, at that point in time as it is today? And to me, it's just, you know, the reality is that, that doing something on ground if that means filling in a portion of the river is the right decision for the long term, and we just need to figure out a path that makes that possible for, for everyone, um, acknowledging the complications that are on the way to doing that. And I'm sure there's many great minds in this room and, and elsewhere um, who can help figure out that path and figure out the way to, to make that all happen. I did work on the, uh, the charrette with Alan, uh, looking at the overall opportunity. So I want to talk about two scales, you know, one that Antonio um, asked us to think about. Um, you know, we have a project at hand that's not the project that we want. That's really the problem. If you think about the triangle between Commonwealth Avenue, the river, and Cambridge Street, you know, it's about 150, 160 acres. Uh, it's going to get a 
brand new transit station, Great Riverfront. Um, you know, two major landowners, that doesn't happen usually, right? Uh, this is a simple problem to think about. Unfortunately, we're only able to think about only one of the many dimensions that we need to think about, just the infrastructure and a few other things. Any other large project like this anywhere else, you're firing on all angles, urban form, economics, public space making, programming, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, and there is a push and pull in all of these that influences the infrastructure, urban form tells what infrastructure do and vice versa. In, in absence of that, you know, we're left with this unimaginative uh, drawing. I mean, if, if, even if I'm looking at this as a plan for the place, it scares me because it doesn't have any public space. Just right. forget about it, you know. Mm -hmm. We're doing Suffolk Downs right now, same size, 160 acres in East Boston, 160 acres, 40% open space. This is where the contemporary practice mm -hmm. in urbanism is going. Mm -hmm. It is solving ecological, environmental uh, connectivity, mm -hmm. health and wellness, uh, all sorts of things. And then, of course, 16 million square foot development on top of that. You know, Kendall Square is 230 square feet, the uh, acres, the core of it, as, you know, ultimately when Volpe is in, it's going to have 23 million square feet. This is a big opportunity for the city. It is a three-dimensional problem. But right now, there is that vestation which nobody wants to deal with. And there's the world other side, there's the world this side. So I think some of the shred and the work that has been done, the not being timid uh, was done, but that kind of thinking continuously needs to expand. And one thought I'll throw out there is, some of the work that we did for East Cambridge community on a pro bono basis when Kendall Square was going to go through the transformation. East Cambridge community in its wisdom hired us with a very small amount. Uh, tell us what the vision should be and that became a part of the vision for Kendall Square that went into zoning. So I think there is an opportunity to think about that for all of you and the community about the future of the overall thing. Uh, otherwise we'll end up with this. Then specifically about the about the throat, I think you know it, it's a no-brainer. Nobody argues that the highway ought to come down, and even though um, uh, it basically unlocks for a future that we don't know, but it's we know that it unlocks for the best. Uh, the problem seems to be the problem of the project that we have versus the project of the future is the um, the, the pedestrian connection along the river, and um, I, I happen to think none of the solutions are good. Um, and none of them, whether it's uh, with the elevated highway or even with the highway expanded and encroaching into the river, I think there is a big way and big opportunity to think a little bit differently here. We have so much of the Esplanade that looks the same throughout, and we don't need to create more of that here. Since we don't have that much land, why don't we create an elevated uh, um, pedestrian promenade over the Storo Drive? It, it does a number of things. You know, this is where I walk across BU Bridge all the, uh, a lot of times. I live on the other side. By the way, I live in Cambridgeport, and I enjoy access to the river, unlike you all who live on this side. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll get there. Um, actually, my wife does more than I do. She runs every day. Um, and you know, what if we think about a solution that is um, elevated? You know, there is a, I think there is some delta of bringing the whole thing down to grade. And being even after that by the river, behind the automobiles, <laughs> all the noise, I don't think it's going to be pleasant. Mm. So can we think of an elevated promenade? that sort of makes all the connections because the world is not at grade there. You want to connect to BU Bridge, you want to connect to Commonwealth Avenue, which are all 25 to 30 feet above grade. So can we think about a much bigger move for the city and the waterfront, riverfront, that is different from everywhere else, the three miles that we have, um, that can actually solve the problem? It doesn't have to be super permanent. You know, there are many wonderful ways that we can design these things short term, long term. Maybe that gets us out of the river for a little while in this particular iteration, but you still get that right now. You're not sort of uh, pushing this off to a later date. So you're talking about like a, this is the first time I've heard of this, so you're talking about kind of like a high line. Well, yeah, I don't want to use the uh, no word high line, but yeah, that's a good example. Um, but you know, the, you know, the Leachmere Viaduct without the train would be a great example. Um, you know, being up there, actually the, the, because of the bend of the river, you have a fantastic view to the city and it, it's a really nice place to be. And you know you experience that going over the BU Bridge, for example. So, um, and again, there is a much larger connection. There is one connection, but in fullness of time, there is a diagonal here from Beacon Yards along the Turnpike Civic Vision all the way to Fenway Park and into Back Bay. If we get it all right, we're thinking you know 50, 100 years. So that throat actually at that elevation actually can link you into a very different system as well. So my my sort of I know everybody worked. Um, uh, I'm sure somebody had this idea before. Can we just give up on, at least in this round, 
asking for pushing into the river, can we ask for an elevated promenade that really creates a great uh, sort of an offset in mitigation that links uh, some of the future opportunities. So. It's very interesting. <laughs> and, and do you expect that that would be easier to permit than um, filling in the river or uh, the other um, boardwalk ideas? Uh, I don't know much about the permitting. It seems as though that would be the case because you're not going into the river. Um, and, you know, we talked about the experience. I think it provides a better experience because you're not dealing with the noise. And, you know, eventually if the city builds up to it, it's even better. We can, uh, you know, create some kind of a TIF mechanism that whoever benefits from it, you know, will, you know, eventually pay back or something. But I think it sets up a different datum line that overcomes a lot of dimensional challenges that we have there right now. Yeah. Well, you know, we talked a, a, a bit about investments, um, how this is an investment in the future and thinking about how it will unlock certain economic development and uh, uh, other kinds of financial um, uh, good things. Um, but, you know, when we, we compared it a little bit to the moment where we decided to take down the elevated um, green monster central artery and build the Rose Kennedy Greenway, et cetera, one of the big differences between then and now, and it was only, you know, whatever, 20 years ago, but um, we're facing a very different period financially um, in terms of support from the federal government. I, don't, I can't even remember, was it $14 billion? I don't remember how much it turned out to be, 20. Um, I don't see us getting that kind of support from the federal government. One of the problems, I think, with this, this whole um, proposal is that, you know, there's the, the city's involved in this, but the state is involved, and, you know, there's a lot of different layers of, of um, governance um, competing. So I'm looking at Jim again. Um, where do we get the money for these kinds of projects? Should it be a... Um, you know, even a discussion point at this at this early you know phase, this sort of visioning phase. Um, how practical is it? Well, so the money issue is a complicated and, and difficult issue, but we can let's talk about it. I just want to react to that. I think it's yeah. a brilliant idea, but I also want to make the point. So you think about the Charles River and how it was created into what it is today by some very civic-minded people, James Jackson Starrow and folks like that at the turn of the last century. And think about who's paid for the upkeep being clean and, and everything else. It's sort of, we keep tend to forget as taxpayers and citizens, these, these assets are ours. Right? We own that they're ours. And so the idea that we want to intrude into the river for our quality of life, just let that absorb a little bit, right? As opposed to, I want to build my highway into your river, right? Different way of thinking about it. We have a revenue crisis. I mean, let's, I call it a crisis. Uh, it's a crisis because we, can't, we don't have enough new, net new revenue to do everything we need to do, right? We know this, we read about it all the time. The MBTA has a $7.3 billion state of good repair gap. And would if you, you excuse me, would you like him to use the other microphone? Is no, that, it's fine. Is okay. right? yeah. it was, it's a little poppy. Go ahead. And if you knew what was not in the $7.3 billion that should be in there, if you wanted to think about what really needed to be done, it, it would be mind boggling, right? Um, if, so we, we have a net new revenue gap. We need to raise money. There are lots of ways to do it. You know, the city was very creative last week or so in thinking about, well, we're going to ask scoff laws to pay more money in fines and we're going to use that money we're going to dedicate it to sustainable mobility enterprises you know better dedicated bus lanes and better cycling that, that's one way to think about it i've been calling a long time for things like putting a carbon fee on non-residential parking in the city right? imagine all the parking spaces non-residential and capturing some of the actual impact of these fossil fuel driven cars. Now, this idea falls apart if every car is electric, but <coughs> we're not close to having that happen. And asking people to pay some fair share and dedicating that money to things like better, safer streets, complete streets, safe cycling zones, and transit. That's what we're talking about here, really, is, is a safe, welcoming place to have the many thousands of people who use it and want to use it, uh, encourage them to do what we want people to do, which is be safely mobile through the city. 
But you're right. I mean, right now we're in a we're in a place where you've got too much competition for too little revenue. And unless we as citizens let political leaders know that we would actually have their back if they did something about it. I mean, people, the senator's here, so I, <laughs> uh, I'm not saying like him out, he's one of the more progressive people on these topics, right? But if political elected leaders are fearful that the consequences of doing difficult votes on taxes or fees is going to put them out of work. Well, we know what the, the there's a fight or flight syndrome whenever there's fear, and they're not going to fight, right? They're just going to say no. If we need to let them know we have their back, that we support re principled, reasonable efforts to raise the net new revenue that we need to get done what needs to be done. We also need to support the efforts of people who are trying to squeeze out efficiencies. I'm all for that. I'm not for profligate spending, and I believe in performance metrics. But we still need revenue to accomplish the goals we need to accomplish. Getting West Station built early, for example. Right? We're asking Harvard and BU to pay money. Right? We're asking people to engage in pay to play, is the expression, because we don't have enough net new revenue. So we have to be realistic about that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't say no to a bad idea. We should say no to a bad idea. And sometimes having, getting nothing done is better than getting the wrong thing done. Others on that question, revenue or political will to get this done? OK, <laughs> hearing, hearing we'll do, none. We'll do ideas that cost money. <laughs> <laughs> hearing no other comments, I think I'll, I'll turn to the audience and see, uh, because I know there's going to be, actually, I wanted to, is Tad Reed still here? Can you just say a few words, please? Sure. Yeah, representing the city. And um, I, I think as uh, Harry pointed out, we did um, lead the placemaking study. I think, you know, we're on record as saying we want to see the kind of um, community here that, that uh, Jim described. I think the term you used was sustainable mobility ecosystem, and I think that would be a good description of what the placemaking study called for here. <laughs> Um, and we're on record as well through our comment letter on the DPIR that, uh, you know, we sort of the reaction is what's not to like about the at-rate option. And I think the, the, the question for us is the permitting question. Um, if you listen to the different parties, if you listen to MassDOT, you get one set of answers about um, the uncertainty in timing and cost that the permitting questions pose for the project. Mm -hmm. The secretary has made it clear that they've got an, a, a, a viaduct at the, at the end of its useful life, and it needs to be replaced soon. She's concerned about uh, cobbling together the funding just to replace that piece of infrastructure, much, much less you know, all the other wonderful things we all think should be part of this project. So I know she's very concerned about timing, about being able to move forward with this quickly, and the permitting uncertainty for her is a big question. So we're sympathetic to that notion, and what we'd like to see is these, you know, some, some sort of uh, meeting of the minds about uh, these permitting questions. Um, there are other perspectives. The ABC has, has done some research on the permitting issues and has concluded that they're not as, as complicated or dire. So can we bring together those two perspectives and get some answers about those issues? There certainly, there are some, some people have raised questions about losing the breakdown lanes and reducing the lane widths and the safety issues that that brings and the air quality impacts that the traffic congestion that would ensue, ensue from a breakdown. Um, and so, you know, what are the answers to those questions as well? So, again, what's not to like, but let's get to the bottom of these permitting issues. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to say my name. My name is Ann Lusk. I work at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. I have emailed you. I've emailed Tom Nally. I came to Boston 15 years ago, and I worked extremely hard attending all of the meetings to try to get a cycle track on the outside edge of the Rose Kennedy Greenway, and was told no. And now we have a Rose Kennedy Greenway, and we have a lot of biking in the road. The city's finally getting cycle tracks, but we kill people while we wait for the cycle tracks. Thank you for the lid over the throat. I've attended every meeting about the Harvard-Alston-Brighton area, 
And in the very beginning meetings, if any of you have been at those meetings, I asked for the lid over the throat. I, a lid over, it's, a, it's a cover over the throat. You can cantilever it out. You can do it affordably. I already worked with Ari, and I know that if you're coming up from the Paul Dudley White, that it's ADA accessible. My PhD is in architecture and environment behavior, so I also have to look at the environment. And putting a park beside the river means all of that mobile source air pollution and noise is right beside the path. So if you cover over the throat area, you can have a beautiful park lid. So it was proposed, what, five years ago when we all started attending the meetings about this one section. And other than sending it to Harvard and sending it to Tom Nally and sending it to everybody else, I don't know how to make the point more clear. It's a great idea. Boston should be much more visionary than we have been. It's easy to put a park beside the river. It's easy to take the land and do that. Why can't we be as visionary as having a millennial park or a high line in Boston? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Miller. I'm with the Bubble Streets Alliance. I want to pick up on something that Kishore said and turn it into a question for Jim. Um, this really should be, as you started to describe, a community development project. This is about creating a neighborhood, an economy, but in fact what we have is a transportation project. And we have a transportation project because the money is the transportation money. It's coming out of the turnpike. How, as a person who was a secretary, can we create, use that funding, because we're not going to, in the short term, in the time we have to build, rebuild the viaduct, we're not going to get new funding out of nowhere. How do we take a transportation funded project and have the internal politics that turn it into a community development project within which there's a transportation component instead of the tag, the, the dog wagging the other tail? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> So a lot of people who work in Ten Park Plaza would tell you that their job is to build and rebuild highways and not do community development, right? You can, there's a different secretariat for that. Exactly. Now, that assumes that we all are operating in silos and we live in an interconnected world. I think the idea that we should all be operating in silos is a sort of an anachronism in today's world. So I agree with you. I think that these are connected. Now, there are limitations legal limitations on how some of that, how that money, Metropolitan Highway System, which is the toll-funded system that starts at Route 128 and comes into Boston and connects the tunnels and the, what we call the Big Dig, there are limitations on what you can do with that revenue. But I keep saying, look, I understand that. We need to find new creative ways to raise net new revenue that are not constrained and that can be dedicated to these issues. But I think you raise a larger point, which is how it goes, you know, this word connectivity keeps coming up. Oh, you can't look at anything, including the throat, in a vacuum any longer, right? These things are all connected. If you think about the issue that was just talked about, this fellow from BPDA gave a good sort of description of some of the challenges that they're confronting as they're trying to sort out the issue, right? and people raising concerns of something like uh, air quality because of traffic jams. Well, that assumes that we're doing nothing to encourage modal shift, right? Modal shift means getting people who drive and putting them on a commuter rail, right? That assumes we're not rethi rethinking the whole way we think about commuter rail, right? And we just, transit matters just sort of report promoting the concept of regional rail as a way to, to completely rethink how we move people between Boston and the gateway cities around the city. So all of these things are connected. Now, they're converging in a time crunch here. I get it. We've, you all are, are facing the imminent decision making that could make or break this area for the next 50 years. And so we don't have the luxury of time to say, well, we'll do regional rail. All these things are connected, which is why I say, I think, practically speaking, right now, you need to do a little triage. You need to say, <coughs> where are the powerful stakeholders? Can they be helpful? What's the, what's the, what is the framework for this discussion that needs to be consistent, right? And make it a powerful, frame the discussion powerfully in a way that the powerful stakeholders can adopt as their own and, and do something here that won't 
lock you into, the, you know, again, I think people should be clear that the current preferred view of an elevated road and keeping the throat the way it is, is basically what the state is saying in an election here. The state is saying we're doubling down on the mistakes of the past, right? Imagine the thought process that goes into saying, admitting that that's what's going on. We're doubling down on the mistakes of mid 20th century for you folks in Austin. Isn't that great, right? Because the, the answer to back should be what, right? Because that doesn't respond to the mayor's Go Boston 2030 vision. It doesn't respond to the, uh, the values of the people who live in the city today. Their values are not represented by mid-20th century auto-centric thinking. And that's what this represents. That's what the preferred DEIR solution represents, right? West Station sometime in the future, elevated highway. And be careful because you might get hit by a car as you're walking along the river that you own. Hi, uh, Alan Freed, a uh, Brooklyn resident, a few blocks from BU. Uh, my interest is obviously going to the river, like other people have said. I really appreciate Harvard's presentation because it's great that they're at the table. It's their land. I would expect them to be there investing in this. I don't see BU stepping up. I've been to meetings where they don't want any connections. They don't see this as a new front door. They see this as people traipsing through their yard, and that's disappointing. I love the idea of the lid. I wonder, and I think of the example of the East River Plaza in New York, which is great, unless you're in a car. Could we think of this as something that's terraced? Is there any way to reduce, to lower the road even a little bit Submerge it a bit. I know that's pricey, but how about some combination? Sure. Well, I think um, if we put the right set of variables on the table, and you know, I don't know if we're asking the right questions. If we ask the right questions, then the priorities will change. Um, right now, I think we're given a project, and we're just trying to figure out how to get around it, rather than completely redefining the 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 project. So. Um, you know, again, I, I, I think the lid is a much bigger idea. We're, um, what I was talking about is not something that planned. It doesn't have to be. Eventually, it can get there, but I think you know it can be done much more economically, um, but provides the connectivity and so on. So there are lots of ways to rethink this if you know the time is not an issue and if um, <coughs> you know there is a process in place that allows for that kind of an investigation. Again, there is a finite amount of real estate uh, there. You know, do you go horizontally or vertically? Yeah, but right now. It's always vertical because that's the, the nature of it. So part of it is if you don't want to encroach and extend the permitting period, you just reverse the equation and uh, solve for everybody's problem in some ways. Uh, but then ultimately, if, the, if we can expand it to the river 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, that's even better. It becomes an opportunity. You know, I, th I understand that Liz Leary is here from BU. I don't want to put Anybody on the spot here, but you want to sure. say a few words to answer the gentleman's question? Just to clarify a little bit. So BU is very interested in river connections, and we've been at this since the very beginning, and we continue to be working at it. We've worked very, very hard with ABC to actually make that at-grade solution possible. So in order for that to work, if it does, if we can make it work, um, that would require some plan from BU. We've been very open to that. So. Um, just to clarify where we are. And we've also been very supportive of uh, transit at Melbourne Street to help connect Comal and the new station. So maybe there's some misinformation out there, but thank you for giving me time to just correct that. Sure. So, uh, and I don't know if Renata wants to come up. And, so I'm Wendy Landman. Most of you, many of you know me. I'm the executive director of Walk Boston, and we are the co-host of this event with the Charles River Conservancy. And I just wanted to say that this is actually an advocacy moment. <laughs> so we've had wonderful panelists speaking about lots of different opportunities and lots of different things that I think people need to be thinking about in terms of getting their voices <laughs> at the table. So when we, with Sasaki's help, put together this little video, Unchoke the Throat, that generated, where's Bob, 160 comment letters right. to, Mass to MEPA, which led to a different kind of scope that MassDOT has to respond to um, about this project. 
But that's sort of a beginning of the advocacy. There's a lot more work to be done in the coming years. And many of you represent all sorts of interesting viewpoints that haven't been heard very loud yet. Many of the people in the design community. Again, some folks have been sort of coming up and coming up with ideas, but I think this idea that what we need to do is not, I like Jim's phrase, not double down on the mistake, mistakes of the past, but go forward in a positive way. So we need your voices to do that. Um, my, this advocacy has been being done, um, I guess I would say on a shoestring by the organizations that are doing it. We're not, you know, we're not underwritten by anybody who's saying, hey, you know, the future of the city is to get this right. So, you know, that kind of support is helpful too, but really speak up, speak out. The design community should really be weighing in. Um, some of you in the room know that Walk Boston, before my time, was deeply engaged in the Greenway. And we didn't end up at a perfect place, but boy, we ended up at a place that was an awful lot better than it would have been, which would have been essentially a highway on top of the highway. And we're not there because people said, we need to be able to walk. We need to be able to have development opportunities here and make this a part of the city. And as much as you know, we can talk about some of the flaws by comparison to what it used to be with a highway here, this is a really, really different place. So. I think most of you signed in tonight. Um, we'll write back to all of you, but really, you know, use all the different ways you can to be speaking out about this so that we end up with a place that we want to be and, and we don't, you know, our children and grandchildren don't look at us and say, How where were come you? you? Where were you? Mm -hmm. You know, what happened here? You know, this was a bad <laughs> idea when the highway was built and now why are we, why are we doing it again? So I think um, the governor needs to hear from you. The secretary of transportation needs to hear from you. The secretary of economic development needs to hear from you. Uh, no, I, I, I think this is a terrific sort of wrap-up statement. But you know what? I'm not done yet. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you for that. I should have called it you on you last, but we didn't organize this obviously um, ahead of time. So there are some more questions I thought we would go yes. to. There's one way in the back uh, there. I'm with the Charles River Alliance of Boaters, and I'm one of the people that put together the depth chart of the Charles River, the first one in 100 years. Um, there's been a lot of chat tonight about extending the land out into the river. Okay, that is going to impact the river community in a big, big way. Taking 45 feet, 50 feet of river is a big <coughs> impact to us. There are roughly 6,000 rowers that use that river every single day. And that region down there is a very busy region for rowing. So we want to be very <coughs> careful when we start talking about taking some of the water. Okay, because it's going to impact the recreational habitat that we have. And I just want to leave you with the idea that the Charles River is probably the busiest recreational river in the country, if not the world. It is a jewel for us. We want to protect it as much as we can and allow it to be the jewel that it is today. Go back to the key, key question, you know, with the mass out alternative, the, the ABC, the other alternatives, all assume that you're having an eight lane mass pike, you're having a four lane soldier's field road, and next to West Station, you're having 14 lanes. That's three or six lanes of the mass pike, and then four lane uh, frontage roads on either side. Right now, the mass turnpike is only, I think, six lanes in that section. So the question is, you know, with the, the modeling that was done with all this, uh, what happened was that, you know, Mass that put in the model, it said, we're going to assume the same single occupancy vehicles or non-restricted vehicles, and we're going to move X number of cars. It was not about X number of people. So the question is, you know, in, in, in all this process, uh, why not focus on creating Soldiers Field Road down to one lane in each direction at the throat, making Mass Turnpike three lanes in each direction, so at least then you're limiting the cross section you could then have the wider park, you don't impact the river, um, you can do all sorts of things. So, you know, let, let's, 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 let's not assume we should just have the same number of highway lanes and let's make one of those lanes a high computer. That's a vote for non-thoughtful timidity, right? That's a, that's a proposal for, um, you know, let's sort of zero sum this thing and say, you know, let's start the roads with one lane and see, you know, how far we really have to go. So. It's very interesting. From okay. Louisville Streets Alliance, we've talked a lot about the what's, and there's some wonderful ideas here. I hope that some of them could be bolder. Let's talk a little bit more about the how. Uh, and 
Wendy took us back to the central artery. I'll take you back to the Southwest Corridor and Governor Sargent's decision not to build the Southwest Expressway in 1972. Mm -hmm. And I think that the lesson to be learned there is that we didn't say, yes, but. We said, no, and here's what. Uh, and in that case here, I think we have to figure out how to talk, and this is the question of how to get at a state and city administration that are not necessarily headed in the right direction. Uh, in the case of the state, uh, they have given away their rights to Back Bay Station and to make it into a shopping mall so that it is going to harm commuters and reduce their income from increased fares. Uh, in the case of the city, they're still trying to cut down trees on Melanie Cass Boulevard to make a bike lane when the bike lane could be behind those trees rather than cut down the trees. So how do we get at the city and how do we get at the state to get them to understand that these building of an entire piece of the city with connections between BU and Harvard, with connections to the river, uh, are things that actually are essential if work is going to go ahead. Yeah, I think it just goes back to the point that I was making that, you know, any other place, most places, not every place, would look at this through multiple lenses, and we unfortunately are still looking at this from only one lens. Um, I don't know, um, I know that there, everybody's trying to do their best, um, but I don't think there's a singular force here that can actually bring it all together. I, uh, that's the frustrating part of this, and I agree with you. I don't have an answer. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of um, advocacy 101. I mean, I know a lot of people in this room who know how to do. I don't think it's I tend to. Is this on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? All right. I tend to burn these things out. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's not, not on. Not on. All right. So I'm just going to. Just talk. So, you know. Half the room are people I know who like know how to do advocacy. So there's no, you, you know how to do it, right? I think the question that I would put back to you is, there's a larger conversation to be had about how to get this perfect. And that should take place. But you're faced with a schedule. You're faced with decision making in the short term. So you've got to triage this. You've got to figure out how to get to the secretary and the governor and the mayor in particular to be aligned with your thinking. I mean, in the short term, when it comes to dealing with the throat, dealing with making sure that West Station is not built in 2040, but we begin building sooner. And again, I think the way to do it is to find like-minded people. Hopefully some of them are, are among that like-minded group of powerful stakeholders. I think the media is on your side. I think that advocacy groups, livable streets, transit matters, and others who tend to get noticed and tend to be able to get some things done are on your side. So bring them all together in a call <coughs> to action because the time is short. And frame the argument well and make the case for why the mistakes of the past shouldn't be repeated. I mean, that's really all this is about. There's no magic to it. There's no magic to it. And, and to the gentleman who spoke about the folks who were rowing and, and on the Charles, I think I would say that in this moment, folks who appreciate the value of the river and open space need to appreciate each other's point of view and come together. Um, it's, it's a finite asset. It has historic value. Going back, as I said earlier, to the days of James Jackson Sturrow, and, and folks who understood that the river could be something that it wasn't through most of the 19th century. And it's important that people take that public asset and understand its value and understand its value to as many people as possible, right, without harming a lot of people. In other words, there's a way to think about its use and its relationship to it, the users of the river and to those who use the embankment in a way that should be compatible and not at odds. Um, those things are not easy to work out, but they need to be worked out because the last thing you need is for advocates for open space and recreational space to be at odds with one another.
Um, I just, I, I agree. I, I am a rower myself, and I can appreciate being both on the river and next to the river. I think about, um, you know, what is what's nice and what's necessary. Um, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for maintaining the river um, to the best of its use, and I also think about the, the safety that comes up with. Um, any pedestrians that are on the on the path next to the river um, and so yes there may be differences in in the river if if the plan that um, that gets carried out does um, change the bank of the river but I also think that um, we need to look at the the bigger system and how we're all integrated looking um, at, at how we all move not only on boat not only in boats but um, as pedestrians and also uh, the vehicles that need to get through that area as well so. and, and I think if we take that one step further we can look at whatever happens through that particular section and frankly along that entire length along the Olsen yards as a potential asset to the users of the river too not just for the people right. on the bank how do we create opportunities for more people to get into the river as long as as well as walk along it? How do we make that area better for the people who are using the river for rowing, be they in skulls or some other type of, of vessel? How do that how does that work for both of that interfaces? And I think if you look at the Chicago example, mm -hmm. that's a very su successful illustration of how you do that kind of thinking. Yeah. So Absolutely. but just to back up to the other idea of how do we get all these people together. We did it for the central Arty and we did it for the streetscapes through the through the staff process through the surface transportation action forum Which was the state the city and all of the stakeholders sitting down Through a fairly compressed schedule and looking at every inch of that corridor and arguing about You know how many lanes and how many crosswalks and how many whatever we had in that and how the streetscapes were built and so on and so forth So there is there is precedent for it you know Joe and Wendy were involved with that very early. Um, I sort of came into the middle of it when a lot of the big grand picture decision making had been done. But it's, it's been done before and it's possible to do that again, I would have to assume. Acknowledge that it has to happen quickly, um, but it, there is precedent. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna take a, a minute of, you know, moderator prerogative here and say that, you know, um, I just got my property tax bill from the city of Boston, and maybe it happened last quarter, but I just noticed it. There's a 20-something dollar fee on my property tax for the Community Preservation Act fund. And, you know, maybe I'm being naive, but um, that was passed by the city of Boston's citizens um, with, that, with a um, tacit approval of the business community. I mean, we haven't really talked about their role in this, um, and they stand to benefit tremendously, I think, from, um, from doing this right. Um, but, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and others who might have spoken out against a new tax didn't. Um, but it was the citizens of Boston, the people who said, tax me! You know, yes, I will take a small um, increase in my property taxes in order to pay for affordable housing, development of open space, and preservation um, projects. And we're seeing that, you know, it's not a huge amount of money yet. It's about $20 million, I think, in the fund right now. But, you know, that'll grow over time. We're seeing it actually happen. I think that uh, something similar can happen here. I don't know. You have to involve the legislature, I understand. But no offense out there, but <laughs> Senator. But, um, you know, I think that, that people shouldn't underestimate, you know, their own power and, and to, you know, make, get the right decisions made on here by, you know, showing that they're willing to even dig into their pockets a little bit um, to get it done right. So I'm going to have to wrap up now and thank everybody for coming. Um, it was a terrific. Thank you.